So I really hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I am. And I just wanted to take a little break to tell you about the amazing products by the sponsor of this podcast, the Biophotonic EMF and Bioresonance devices, which help us take our healing to the next frequency. So let me start with the bioresonance devices. Biophotonic have two amazing little devices, the little Bionexus and the Biophotonic. And both of these are really the next generation in bioresonance devices. So let's start with the little Bionexus. This amazing little device um, literally sits in the palm of your hand. And it's now my go-to support, especially when doing my daily manifestations and affirmation practices. But it will balance out my frequency to work on whatever needs balancing for me right here, right now. So what are some of the benefits of this little bionexus? Improved energy, decreased inflammation, supports our immune system, psychological homeostasis. Um, but also it supports the integrity of the cells, improves our memory, cognitive, emotional and psychological states and speeds up recovery. And just like we've been talking about today, it really improves human consciousness support. Now, the other bioresonance device, the Biophotonic, absolutely amazing little device, um, comes preloaded with a range of therapies. And this will clear parasites, giving active perception protection you can wear it with you it comes in a little pouch that you can wear around your neck and it detoxifies heavy metals clears emf radiation out of cells cleanses bacteria and viruses detoxes chemicals and toxins dna repair pain repair you name it and it's even got calming meditation practices that well complexes that you can run to strengthen the aura field and frequency packs can also be added to your water I think we all know the detrimental effects now of mobile Bluetooth and EMF radiation. They've been extensively studied and I've done loads of videos on it. So minimising our exposure is crucial. So what's really key is both the Biophotonic and the Bionexus. They're standalone lovely little devices that don't require Bluetooth connection, a Wi-Fi connection. You don't need to buy any frequency packages. There's no subscription fee and you don't need a mobile phone to control them. Um, there's no electrodes. They're completely wireless, ready to use straight from the box. So you can get these and a full range of EMF protection devices that you can use for yourself and your pets. Don't forget to use coupon code CE20 to get 20% off all products, including the EMF protection. Thank you. And now back to the podcast. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here with a, a friend of mine now, actually, the amazing Alan James from Circle of White Light. And we're going to have a really great, what I would call not really an interview, discussion today. Really good discussion about a bit of a reality check. Where are we at? What are, what's on our mind at the moment? Where, where are our thoughts at? Um, but before we really get into that, Alan, we've got quite a few new listeners to the show. So even though we've spoken quite a few times on your show and on mine, we've got some new people. So let's start off by finding out a little bit about you. What is Circle of White Light? OK, uh, well, thanks for having me on your show, Catherine. It's great having a chat with you. It's always great having a chat with you. Um, right, Circle of White Light. Well, like you, uh, I've been uh, doing shows for a long time. And I started off doing the radio side uh, back in 2010. And it's only recently I decided to, to, to get onto video kicking and screaming because yeah. apparently my spiritual team said, Alan, you have to go that way. And I'm going, no, no, no. You know, um, uh, voice, uh, face for radio, voice for print and all that. Um, yeah. But uh, I, did, I, I said, OK, I'll give it a go and see how we get on. And actually, I've been quite... Um, uh, quite happy with doing the videos i'm still uncomfortable doing videos you know because i'm not i'm not a professional you know i mean when we do this you know we do it because we have a, a, a conscience to actually try and educate people and the moral conscience behind us and that drives us to try and educate people so whether what we look like is irrelevant i think it's the content and the information is is more important than educating people and waking people up so i've been doing it for a long time 
Um, as I've said to you before, uh, I was like most people when a conspiracy theorist approached me and gave me information. I said, you know, like, you know, the David Icke book I mentioned the last time on, on your show. Uh, I said, oh, you know, you're he's a nutter, you know, he thinks he's God and all that kind of stuff. But because I have a background in psychology, um, I stopped myself and I thought, actually, how arrogant am I? Because ego is made up of arrogance and ignorance. And I said, how arrogant am I thinking I know it more than him when I didn't actually research any of his information? So I, then I went on the journey and I, I started saying, right, I'm going to prove these conspiracy theorists wrong. But I actually proved myself wrong. So a humble pie was eaten. And as as I always say, I apologize to the conspiracy theorists because you are right. The information is correct. And, you know, there is a lot of um, falsehoods out there. Oh, and yes. there's, there's yes. a lot of misdirection. So it doesn't mean you have to believe everything. But this is why I always use the quote from Aristotle. The mark of an educated mind is to be able to entertain the thought we're accepting it. So entertain the information, park the ego to one side, but ask for evidence. And I'm not talking about evidence. I'm talking about tangible evidence. And tangible evidence is very important, you see. And I, I'm trying to get people into thinking this way more and more. This here is a pen, right? Now, I know it's a pen. You know it's a pen. And anybody that sees that will say it's a pen, right? That's well, tangible evidence. Yeah. Look well, the there you go. Are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? I mean, this yeah, is what I, I mean. You get people who get very anal over things yeah. and they go, well, actually, it's not a pen. It's a molecules and there's 99% space. And yeah. OK, come on. Let's let's get real. It's a pen. Right. Now, that's tangible evidence. And that's what we need to be looking at. So when people give us evidence, we need to make sure it's tangible evidence because evidence can be changed and corrupted and made to look like evidence, but it's not. It's been faked or it's been changed and people can be fooled by it. So it's important that we really do our research and cross reference and check and everything else. And over the years, you know, I've been cut out. I'm sure you've been cut out. We thought what we were told was true and it's not true, you know, and we've all had that humble pie and um, where we had to say, sorry, we were wrong with that. And, and that's the adult thing to do to say, you know, and not be afraid to say, yeah, sorry, I was wrong. I love it. So much in there I want to unpack. And my friend Bryce and I talk about the Aristotle, you know, entertain an idea without being attached to it a lot. And that's certainly something I've learned more as I've got older. I think people that knew me 20 years ago would think that that wasn't in my vocabulary then. Um, but it's beautiful how much we can explore and how much information out there and how much sort of critical thought there is around there because everyone I know who's on this path of self-discovery and, and people who aren't on this path like to call us all conspiracy theorists. We we everyone here knows where that name came from, the CIA. So I'm not going to go down there. But um one of the things that I really love um is is keep asking questions. You know, I heard I've just listened to I haven't got all the way through it yet. A really fascinating interview with Elon Musk and Jordan Peterson. And this is one of the things. It's like when people at the moment in our sort of alternative media sphere, I think, Alan, very, people are very quick to sort of jump into, well, how could you listen to that person? They're evil or they're this or they're that or they're that. But actually, a lot of the spiritual teachings, in my understanding, talk about separating the message from the messenger. Yeah. And if we're all in these mortal bodies, whatever you want to call them, that we we've and we all see them differently, and we can all use them differently, and got different challenges, like this this obsession with wanting to go be curious and keep asking questions and understanding that the answer is in the questions. It's not the classic thing. It, it's a journey, not a, desti de a destination. But at the same time, this conflict that seems to be in so many people's different minds about shutting down based on who the messenger is and what their personal feelings are towards that messenger. Yeah, well, that would be people's, uh, my, my, my guess on that would be it's based on people's belief systems mm. and what they've been told. And that will define whether they're going to shut down and not listen to somebody, even though the message could be, uh, you know, forget the messenger, even though the message could be important and educational. But what I've noticed over the years, there are people who have no interest in learning, no mm. interest at all. I mean, organically, they learn a few things, but generally they've no interest in learning and growing and developing 
all you know like for me i know i'll carry on learning until i pass over mm -hmm. because i love learning and i love um analyzing things and and seeing interviews and seeing what people are saying and just to get a more of an understanding of life but there are people who have no interest in that. They will sit down, watch the TV and they they go, look, I've 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 done my bit. You know, I'm just going to watch TV and do me shopping and stuff. And I've no interest in any and in, in anything else. And that's fine if they want to be like that. But then they should not be criticizing people or attacking people who do want to move on and who have spent the time analyzing, looking at the evidence, speaking to people. You know, um, and I think that's important that because you'll get your people. I, I think I said on the last time we, we talked about this, for some people, not knowing something is a weakness mm. and they don't want to say, I don't know. OK, so what they'll do is they'll cover it up and go, well, that's a load of BS and that's a load mm. of rubbish. Right. And that's just a lack of confidence in their intellect. OK, that's the, just the way it is. And I've spoken before about the teenage mind and the adult mild, mind. And recently uh, I did an interview with a psychologist in Australia called, called uh, Ros Nealon. And myself and Ros were talking about the psychology of the teenage adult mind and about, although you can see an adult, really, that adult actually has a teenage mind and you have to approach them in a teenage way. And she said to me, Alan, sometimes these adults are not even teenage minds, they're child minds. And these people could be running the company or they could be in politics, you know, or running a bank. That's scary. I've got to jump in. I mean, I'm in a humorous mood today, but I think, can we cross out could and say, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, uh, just to pick you up on that, because I think this is such an important point for people to understand. Um, when you look into how the body holds, holds a score and the emotional links to trauma and how that can manifest in disease, um, the lovely Yvette Rose, I don't know if you wrote, know Yvette Rose who wrote Metaphysical Anatomy. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. But... I think you've hit on a really important point here that sometimes a lot of people who are still in the child mind or the teenage mind or who have a lot of unhealed wounds themselves do rise to these amazing positions of power. And we can we can come on to talking about about whether it's real power or perceived power. But, yeah. <clears throat> you know, let's just say for a power at the moment. Um, so I'd like your thoughts on that. And I would really like you just to briefly explain. I know it's a very complex um, subject, but what you mean by the child mind, the teenage mind and the adult mind, because people can think that that's just been rude, but it's not. It's science. It's it's actually science and the study science. Yes. And as I say, myself and Ros Nealon, who is a psychologist and she specializes in, in uh, ch child psychology. Uh, we talked about this. Uh, the teenage mind. And this this was a an eye opener for me when I came across this by my studying and analyzing psychology, I thought, Oh my God, that explains so much. Why when you're dealing with an adult, they react in a certain way because you don't know what mind they have. Mm. So the teenage mind is, would be selfishness. It would be um, ego and the victim mentality. And the adult mind would be humility and wisdom. And as parents, and we've brought up our kids, you know, kids fundamentally growing up tend to be very selfish because it's all me, me, me. Right. But as we as they grow up and as parents, we try and teach them to be more considerate of their siblings and people around them and to share and to think of other people and not just themselves. And we hope that they take them skills as they grow up to be young adults and they bring them into adulthood and apply them in adulthood. But not all parents teach their kids them skills. So you have adults who have never been taught them skills about sharing and selfishness and everything else. And they bring that attitude into adulthood. And that's and some childhood trauma and traits would be brought in as well. Yeah. So this is the fear. This is why I said when it was an eye opener for me, I couldn't believe it. I thought, hang on, I'm speaking to this adult. I'm this adult in front of me. But they're acting like a child. Why are they acting like a child? And then I start looking into it and it dawned on me that, OK, if I want to get something out of this adult, or I want to get the adult to do something, not in a manipulative way, but just to have this, you know, interaction with them. I need to speak to them, speak to them in a way that I'd speak to when my son was young as a teenager, as a child. And then I'd probably get the result I'm looking for. And that's really what it's all about. And that was a massive eye opener for me. 
um, in learning about uh, people and how your mind works. Because we talked about, you know, Aristotle and, uh, you know, I talk about the fluid belief system. I've done seminars on this. I was over in Poland last year. I was invited over to Poland to do a talk to a group of people regarding the fluid belief system and the fluid cooperative model, the new business model that we're talking about, about how we can actually apply certain uh, processes in uh, in the work environment to make working better. And, you know, for people doing the work they want to do and getting paid the money they want to get paid, um, and is a friend of mine who's a, a businessman up in Edinburgh. I've been over there with him and he has five businesses and, um, you know, he's rolled that out on his businesses and he's getting great results, you know. So does, there are solutions out there. Talk us through, because I just want to make sure people understand. So the fluid belief model, because this is really, really important, in my opinion, to looking at. Um, you know, a reality check of where we're at, because people do often think that beliefs are set in stone, which, of course, therein lies the problem if your beliefs are set in stone. So what are you meaning by the fluid belief system and how relevant is that to looking at everything that's going on in the world today? Right. The fluid belief system really is something when you start off on this journey and you try and educate your friends and family and you're giving them the evidence and everything else and they're going, oh, you're a nutter, you're a conspiracy theorist. That wasn't working for myself and my co-host at the time, Steve. And I said, hang on a minute, We're, this is not working. We need a different way to help, to try and wake people up. Because we all do it. Everybody does it. As soon as you pull the curtain across and you see just something going on, you start giving the evidence to your friends and family and they're, you're a nutter. You know, we've all experienced it. And I said, well, this is wrong. It's not working. So we need to understand what's going on and why it's not working. So I start applying psychology to it. And I call it the fluid belief system. And it was one that was based on the quote from Aristotle, which I said earlier. And the second one was based on the black and white interview I seen with Bruce Lee when he said that when you're in a street fight, he said, you don't want to be stiff when you're fighting. You need to be fluid. And I said, well, surely your belief systems have to be fluid as well, because our ego is there to protect us. OK, our ego keeps us in their comfort zone. And that's the voice on your shoulder that says, Catherine, don't do that. It's not going to work out. You'll get embarrassed. Blah, 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 blah. That's the ego protecting us. But what we have to do to we have to, to step outside, we need to shut the ego up, step outside our comfort zone and do it, because that's when we start learning and we start growing. But a lot of people are afraid to do that. You know, they listen to the ego and they don't do it. And the belief system is the same. When you start challenging people's belief system, it makes them feel uncomfortable, especially when they've been indoctrinated into a system or into a club or into, you know, the medical profession or whatever. And when they're indoctrinated, it's even worse to try and get them to change or get them to try and challenge their belief system. Um, so that's really what the fluid belief system is. So it's not about whether the moon is made of cheese because that's the content, right? It's irrelevant. It's how that person's mind works when you give them information that challenges their belief system. And the psychology is that when you give somebody information, say you go up to somebody, one of your family members, and you say to them, do you believe there's a, a group of people, a group of elites who run the world? They'll answer in two different ways. They'll either say, oh, that's a load of BS, or they'll say, well, I don't know enough about it to comment. Now, the person who says, I don't know enough about it to comment, is not afraid to say, I don't know, because he's confident with his own intellect, so he doesn't mind showing that weakness. But a person who does want to show the weakness will turn around and say, and say, that's a load of BS. So I could turn around if I wanted that and go, well, I've got 20 years of research and interviews here. But can you give me what you have, which contradicts this information here? And I'm, I'll be more than happy to, you know, take that on board. And 10 times out of 10, they don't have anything. They listen to 10 minutes of the BBC and that's where their their information came from. So. The fluid belief system has really got to do with the psychology. So here's the thing. When it came to a certain medical intervention that we had recently. So I normally say to people, right, say you have two kids in the room beside you and you hear something smashing. When you go in and the two kids are blaming each other, 
you know, you, you don't listen to one of the children and you don't and you, you don't ask the other child. You know, you just listen to one of them, not the other. You listen to both and then you make up your mind based on what the both of them said as to what happened. So your opinion is going to be more relative when you have both sides of the argument. But what we had at the time of the medical intervention, we had one narrative only being pushed. And when the other narrative was put out, it was all poo-pooed and put down. So people can only form their opinion or give their opinion on the information they have at that time, right? So, and an opinion is only an opinion. Only It only becomes a fact when evidence is produced, but it's only an opinion. But there are people out there, even if, believe it or not, in the legal profession, who actually think their opinion is more valid than the actual evidence. Mm -hmm. I've come across that where people actually think their opinion is more important or more valid than the facts and the evidence. So, and that's arrogance, that's ego again coming in there. Okay, so, so when people give their opinion, you have to ask them, what's that based on? What's your, is that based on both sides of the argument or just one side of the argument? Mm. So this brings on, let's make it bring in some fun little things that are going on in the world at the moment then. And I want to preface this with you. You mentioned, and, and I will link my other interviews with Alan below because we had some re that we're, we're tying in with what we discussed with that, even though it was a while ago. So let's David Icke's very much on problem, reaction, solution, where if you know what the end point is, where they, who are, we can come on to there in a minute, are heading for, then the actions start to make sense in terms of what we're doing. Because you can look. Like people, a nice non-psychopathic person could pick up Agenda 2030 and read through it and think, well, actually, a lot of this makes sense. A lot of this is nice. But you can see it in different lights when you're given new information. So with something like um, the Trump, and, and nowadays, for people not watching this, for people listening to this in the podcast, we're always sort of putting our hands up and doing fake exclamation marks as we say something. So I'm going to call it the Trump attempted assassination. Mm -hmm. um, so with the Trump uh, attempted assassination, there's obviously loads of people discussing it and so many possibilities and so many scenarios. And the chances are we'll probably never know. But how, bearing in mind the problem, reaction, solution, distraction, look over here, don't look there, etc. Biden's now missing presumed dead um but then who's biden you know there's all these yeah. it's a never-ending circle and i'm laughing because it is so ridiculous now in in we used to think we used to say um you know trust your eyes trust what you see but you can't trust what you see anymore because we know we've got holograms we've got masks we've got cgi it's so clever what people can do now so when you're looking at scenarios like this, how do you approach it and what words of wisdom have people have you got for people to not get too attached to that's the answer? Well, I keep an open mind. I wasn't there. If I wasn't there, I can't prove anything, you know, unless you're actually there and you're involved and you know what's going on. I can't prove anything. So I can only give my opinion on what I see, but I will always add to that it's just my opinion i could be wrong because i do think there's two kinds of people out there you have your people that will give their opinion and then you have people who are opinionated and people who are opinionated are the people who won't change their mind that's my opinion and you'll accept that and that's the way it is where if you have an opinion these people will say well this is my opinion but i'm, I'm happy to change it because i only know x y and z okay and me and you i know me and you would talk for hours and we'll air uh, our conversations are so open minded and we just bounce off information off each other and nobody is right or wrong or anything. We're just kind of swapping each other uh, information with each other and um, and giving our opinion on it. But, you know, unless you're there, then people can't really say for sure what went down. Um, take, for example, what happened on Friday. Now, we had the, the outage the worldwide outage and the systems went down. Now I'm an ex corporate IT manager, right? So I'm, you know, and you're an, you're obviously a corporate person as well. So you know, I'm familiar with how the systems work and what's going on at the moment. 
And years ago, we had our computer rooms and all our computers were in there and we had our backup power systems and our air conditioning, air conditioning for the computer room and everything else. And when the system went down, that went down and it didn't affect anybody else. But all these companies, again, the the it tends to be the financial guys that tend to be dictating what happens rather than the, the, the IT guys. So they're all putting all their systems out into the cloud. And there's only about three providers of cloud services. Well, one is Microsoft, one is Amazon, and there's another company as well. So they're all putting their eggs in one basket. And this is a typical example. What happened Friday is that one person in this cloud strike cybersecurity company does an update and it, it doesn't go through quality control and they roll it out and then the whole system goes down. That's a lot of power and control. You know, I'd, I'd be very concerned um, with in an IT company. And I'll actually, I'm going to be talking to a couple of people tomorrow in a corporate company about IT, funny enough. And I'd be very concerned about that because I think this is the first of many outages uh, on the systems. And I've been studying, I've been upskilling. I only did a, two weeks ago, I finished the cybersecurity course uh, on cybersecurity. Um, and I know for a fact that People think that they have the antivirus software and their security, everything's okay. But I can tell you now that I could download what's called a RAT program, which is a remote access Trojan program. And I could attach that to a photo and send this photo to you, Katrin. And you could have all your antivirus up to date and I could send you an image. It'd go through your antivirus. Your antivirus won't pick it up. And I go, Katrin, somebody's crashed into your car. Look at the damage. And of course, social engineering, you'll be shocked and you'll go, hey, what's this image? You click on the image. And you'll see a photo, it won't be a car, it could be just a picture of Mickey Mouse or something. And you'll say, oh, Alan's having a bit of fun. But what you've done is you've often opened up the RAT program. Now I can take remote access to your computer and take it over. All right. And it's, so it's not a case of if, it's a case of when. Can I just add to that? Because just an important point, because the other scenario is, I mean, my my opinion, and I don't know because I, um, I wasn't there, but for me, there's no bit about me that really believes the story that's been put out that someone, so I've been in, managing IT departments in risk management for years and no risk manager would ever let that happen like the Trump assassination for those listening in inverted commas so I mean and based on what you're talking about the fact and this is why I, I just the purpose of today's discussion folks is just to sort of have discussions and put it all out there but when you saw the guy, I can't remember his name, being interviewed, I mean, he showed there's a thing about when you're telling lies, it can really block your throat chakra mm. and things. And he could hardly get the words out, the story out. But equally, when we look at the um, events of what happened in 2020 and the pandemic, I'll only say that once or twice in this interview. Before that, the November before, I think it was, they had the um, event 201 where they did an exact plan rehearsal of it. Now, we all know they've done very similar, very recently, the planned rehearsals of, of the cyber attacks. So it could, absolutely could have been some poor guy that did a software upset and it wasn't checked properly because you are right, they have got all their eggs in one basket. But it could equally be the testing for this. Exactly. And I mean, they tell us what they're going to do before they do it. And I did a video on this the other day on my channel and I got the clip from the X-Files where the guy says it will happen on a Friday. The banks will go down. There'll be some excuse. Right. I've just took that clip out of the X-Files and put it in there because this is what they, this is what will probably happen. And yes, 7-7 uh, seven, seven in London, because I was in. I think I was living in London at the time. Um, seven seven, they did wasn't weren't they doing testing and trial at the time yeah. of a potential bomb on the on the tube, and it just so happened that you know it happened. Um, so they do tell us, and they uh, they like uh, testing. I think the medical intervention was a test for digital ideas because what will ha what's coming down the line for people, and I'm I, I don't want to be negative, but I, I'm I'm being a realist is that. The whole idea of the AI, I've used AI, I've used ChatGPT, I've, I've produced images using AI software and I've used ChatGPT to help me with Python programming, with programs that I've developed. And what, what is happening is that you can't 
for sure know whether it's real or it's AI. And what will happen, and the digital ID thing is to kind of prove who you are. But the next step to that, the banks and the mortgage companies and everything else would be gone. We don't know whether that's your voice or that's your image. I think if you have a microchip in your hand, then that will prove to us that it's you. And this is where they're going to go. Well, can they I will... just, I keep butting in, but just because it's an important yeah. point. So I love, I don't know if you watch Redacted YouTube channel. They're really Now and again, yeah. But they posted an interview with someone, I can't remember who it was because I've listened so much, but halfway through this interview, I'll send you the link afterwards. And if anyone wants it, look on my Telegram channel, Catherine Edwards Laugh on Telegram, because I've put it on there with the timestamp. And one of the reasons with the alleged Trump assassin, this 20 year old boy, one of the um, interviewers was sort of saying it was that how did, was he identified so quickly when he had no ID on him? And one of the police said, well, due to the recent vaccine rollout, we've now got people's identity on file. And this, this in the, all the discussions, it's the only interview I've ever seen where they've mentioned that. And then they're on to the next thing. And I'm like, this is the whole crux of the whole thing. It's like, if that's true, then, and if not, why did they mention it? Because all in plain sight. But if it's true, they're saying that they could identify him with no idea instantaneously, somehow connected to the rollout of the intervention program. So it could be the swap, it could be the chip that they might or might not have put in. Of course, we're all conspiracy theorists for thinking that. But it's really interesting, isn't it, how these little bits of the big tool puzzle, unfortunately now the timelines are going bang, 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 and it's almost like the dominoes have been pushed over. Yeah, the the whole idea of um, uh, the chip inside you, well, years ago I interviewed people who are targeted and individuals, yeah. you know, and are targeted for a reason, and people have found chips in their body, and he said, well, how the hell did that get there? I went in for an operation, all of a sudden there's a chip in my body and I was actually trained by two people who are TIs and they told I have the technology here to scan your body for microchips. It takes about 45 minutes and I, they, they taught me how to do it. But the trouble is that the, na the nanotech is so small now, it can fit inside vaccines. And what happened when the medical intervention happened, there was a, a Bluetooth app that you could actually get and download and you'd go around near people and all these MAC addresses were coming up. And for people who aren't techie, a MAC address is an identifier for all hardware in the IT world. Does it, you know, all, all computer systems and technology has a MAC address. And you'd go into a room um, and you'd think the only thing that's in here is probably a printer or maybe a computer. But yet you'd have nine MAC addresses and you think, oh, there's five people sitting in the room as well. And you think, OK. Why is there all these MAC addresses when there's only one piece of IT in here, you know? So um, I know I, don't, I can't prove that either way. It was something that was said at the time. And if people go on YouTube and look it up, you can download the Bluetooth, Bluetooth app. I think I have it on my phone. And you get all these MAC addresses and you think, OK, could that be the nanotech? Could be it could be that's what's in the jab. And could be could it be that these uh, CIA, FBI, when they caught this chap, had a technology, had some scanner, and they could actually check? Mm, could know. It's just an interesting, again, I'm not pretending I know anything about any of this. It's just a, a very interesting thing because, you know, we used to say the difference between a conspiracy theory and a fact was about 20 years. And yeah. now it's more like 20 days, you know, um, in terms of why time is speeding up so much. So it's something for people to be aware of and to really listen and really listen into because with a lot of these this information I mean I want to go back I think it's very important when people are sort of saying where are we now anyone who studies the hermetic principles spiritual teachings we know that the the master controllers whatever you want to call them the people that might be have nefarious plans and very different belief systems from most of the people watching this that there is something in their belief systems that I mean they do have to plan it in all plain sight most people watching this, I mean, I'm laughing because my son used to really love The Simpsons and I never really watched it. And now I'm like, oh, I wish I'd watched it with him because I'd know what was about to be happening. So, you know, with these things, with things like The Simpsons and um, predictive programming and telling us all in advance, you know, 
what, where were you at with all that and how, how are you seeing this all play out? Well, we said we'd call this the reality check because over the years, I, I've made a few notes here on my other screen. And over the years, I've heard all different variations of, you know, uh, the reality that we're in. So if I just go down to them four, and there might, there might be more, I just put four down. I'm not sticking the four, but I just put the four down. So the four kind of different versions of re our realities, there's, there's four of them. The first one is the belief that we're in a holographic program set up by advanced ETs. Could they be the Anunnaki? Could they be the Archons? And for whatever reason, they set this hologram, holographic program up. And when we get unplugged from the matrix or when we pass over, do, like Avatar, do we wake up on this bed and somebody comes up to us and go, well, how did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy that 3D world? Right. That's one version. And I've spoken to, again, guests and people talking about this holographic program and glitches in the Matrix and boards that are just in thin air, not doing anything. There's the glitch and the plane not moving in thin air, just not doing anything. And you think, what's going on there? And the clouds being in a square shape, you know, there's no shit there's no straight lines in nature as you say then the other thing is the fact that we've been seeded again by an advanced race of ets and there was a french racing driver called claude real who in the 70s went through a forest and came across a ufo he went on it cut long story short they took him up in it and they explained to him about the whole creation um of uh, life and his i think his book is called the true face of god and it's very interesting. And he then created a movement called the Raelian movement. And I ended up interviewing the um, the guy who ran the Irish version over here. He, this is going back years. Um, but so he he believed and he was told by these ETs that there was five ET races that seeded the planet and created different. And this is why we have white, black, you know, um, Chinese and you know uh, different races because of this is this is what he did. There was different ET groups and their job was to create different races for this planet. Um, so that's another uh, uh, belief system. The other the other one, the third one is creationism, and creationism is God. You know, God created everything. You know, and um, basically, um. He, you know, he, they talk about we're all particles of God, and he created this experiment because he wanted experiencing, he wanted to experience life through us for him, right? And um, so that's the creationism, creationism side of things. But when you see a photo of Adam and Eve with belly buttons, you kind of go, okay, somebody's got it wrong here, right? Because if Adam and Eve was created and not born, they wouldn't have belly buttons. Mm. Okay, so that's a good one for the people who are very religious. That's a bit of a teaser, you know. And the fourth one is Darwinism, that um, life just started, you know, out of a single cell organism. And then it went from there. And over millions and millions of years, you know, uh, creatures uh, were created and changed and everything else. And um, it's kind of we're in the Goldilocks you know, uh, uh, area in space where it's not too hot and not too cold. So it's ideal. And plus there was water on the planet, you know. And um, so the Darwinism approach talks about that. And um, and obviously there's a website called the Darwin Awards. And it's got, got to do with people taking themselves out of the gene pool for doing stupid things like the two guys in Texas playing catch with a rattlesnake, you know. Um, so it's interesting if you go up to the website and see what how people have killed themselves. So there's my four variations of the reality check of, you know, where are we? Why are we here? Now, my argument to all of this or to some of this, well, to all of it really is what we're seeing is a lot of people who are suffering. A lot of people being abused, suffering, killed, shot, whatever, going through pain, yeah. health issues. And Sorry. A of, and a lot of animals. I do think. Uh, yeah, totally. Out. Yeah. Yeah. The whole a lot of plants and a lot of everything you know? yeah the whole gamut right so mm -hmm. and i said to you when we were talking the other week i said well if i pass over and i'm presented in front of whoever created this program my first thought is to give them a good kick in the nuts yeah he, she it who i mean as spiritual people me and you catherine would we 
ever create a system where people are going to suffer or something's going to suffer. You know, I agree with this completely because this fits into that. It fits into so many of those models because, you know, as you say, what sort of God or what sort of whoever's controlling the matrix would create a world where animals eat each other or where humans invent slaughterhouses or where we do such atrocities to mm. our own species and everything. I mean, as you say, the nature's a really cruel place. Yeah, well, the, the Darwinism of of um, just a single cell organism growing and then developing in nature and the, the survival of the fittest. Um, it is a cruel place. Um, why? Wh whoever it was, whether it's, well, look, Darwinism kind of stands on its own because there's nobody behind it. It's just, they're saying it was just the way, you know, the, li the, the way life is. But the whole idea of creationism, which is God or the ETs, so the other three, somebody's behind it yeah right so take your pick and if somebody is behind it they're, 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 that's a bit sick that's definitely psychopaths yeah yeah, yeah. And, they, they, and then they'll say they may say to you oh well you don't understand oh yeah. ego I, you know why are you creating this you know I mean that's well, you can you can justify all these things. So I I have you know I I I will openly say I I find e um, animals a lot easier to understand and more pleasurable to be around than a lot of humans. Yeah, I know that that's a very unpopular point of view. However, um, you know when we were when you're looking at a lot of these arguments and things. So take. I can't remember who said it, but, you know, this black and white thinking is another form of delusionism. So two things can be true. And in fact, multiple things can be true. So I'm listening to a lot of people talk about the carnivore diet at the moment. And then people will slag off and say it's impossible to be healthy as a vegan. Well, that's just ego speaking, because it might be impossible for you to be healthy as a vegan based on loads of factors, you know, belief systems being the main one. Um, but... Um, it, it is so ridiculous when you sort of think we have these arguments, you can justify anything based on your belief system. So there's a mm. lot of people that say that sort of um, natives from all areas of the world, when they hunt, they can be a lot more respectful and they will pray and they will take the weak ones and they will give thanks and they will eat every bit of the animal, which in my opinion is a million times better. It's like my cats, when my cats catch something and eat it, I don't feel as bad as when they catch something and don't eat it. However, to say that a lot of these animals, from a human perspective, that their belief system is that they've come here and they've chosen to come as a cow that's in a slaughterhouse and intensively reared and done that, there's a to me, there's a certain type of arrogance. You know, as a human, we can make any scenario fit our belief systems to absolve us of guilt and changing our actions now that mm. doesn't mean that that might not be true as well i don't know i mm. might when i you know come go off to wherever i'm going up in the sky on that not not the straight line clouds now the fluffy clouds please <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but i think it is quite interesting this this mix of the rational mind where you can you can convince yourself of anything if you try hard enough often mm. actually tuning into what we call intuition and sort of saying well does this really sit comfortably for me there's a lot of people talking about intuition a lot more now and not trying to just think about doing things from the logical mind, aren't there? Well, yeah. I mean, you have to apply logic as well. I mean, I'm an IT guy and I've been trained to think logically. Um, but, I, you know, I try and look at you know, other sides like intuition and my gut feeling on certain things. And sometimes there's a conflict of interest there. Um, regarding the whole the, the vegan meat eating carnivore diet, you know, I, I try and look at it this way. Well, first of all, I have a joke with people. I am a carnivore. I normally say I'm a second level vegetarian. The cow eats the grass and I eat the cow. But um, I did do an interview with a very interesting doctor in America called Dr. Terry Walls. And she was a, a, a vegetarian for 20 years. And then she she got MS. And she thought, hang on a minute, you know, why did I get MS and what's the cause of it? And because she was a medical doctor and she'd access to all uh, the the other doctors and the experts around her, she actually went to start analysing what was going on re regarding MS. And would you believe that she is now 95%, if not, 
100% back to normal. And she felt that she needed to, whatever was in the meat, she needed to eat meat as part of her diet to get back to uh, good health. Now, that got me thinking. And I said... Say, just to, just to partner that, I'm going to bring in afterwards the Joe Dispenser information because she could have done that just through belief alone. You yeah, know. no, it's, well, she's a medical doctor. I assume that oh, she's... she's, so she's about the people on Joe Dispenser's team who've shown that you can completely reprogram your genetics through thought alone. Yeah, you know, look, as I say, I'm just... So I'm you not know, it, yeah. but it isn't... Yeah. Our, I think we yeah. talk about beliefs being changeable, but beliefs yeah. are so important yeah. to our health, our mental mm. health, the way we live our lives, the choices we make. I mean, beliefs affect everything we do or think or are. Yeah, and that's why I, that's why it's always good to have a fluid belief system because I'm not tied to anything. But what I felt from having that interview and subsequent talks with you know other doctors and people was maybe there's something in their blood type that maybe for some people they can be vegetarian um, because of their blood type and maybe other people because of their blood type, they need what's ever in the meat. Now, I'm only, it's only, I'm only surmising, this is uh, subjective, not objective, because I don't know. But it, it may be just something in their, in, in their blood that it dictates something and is a trigger. Um, and we have the power of our mind to change and do things. Of course, we can do that. Um, so I'm just being kind of devil's advocate, but I'm not kind of tied to any idea. I'm more interested in finding a solution. I do agree, I totally agree that the whole idea of the slaughtering process is wrong. I think that's wrong. Um, I mean, if you're going to be eating meat and you want to eat meat, then there has to be a better way because I don't think the, the whole idea of the emotion and the stress and the worry is all inside that animal when it happens and we're digesting that in the meat and I do believe that mm. so I think we need as human beings we need to find if you are going to eat meat I think we need to find a better way of doing it and I'm not too sure what that is but there must be a better way of doing it um, yeah. but I'm, again I'm open minded to anything any change I am and I think you know our belief systems are everything for that I mean there's a really good new I don't know if you've seen it yet Joe Dispenser um, documentary called I think it's called Source or The Source or something but you can find it very easily and the best bit about it for me was like seeing all these medics because if you look for it in science you will find it so you can prove because it, it doesn't matter how double blind a placebo study is you cannot take every variable out of it you can't take what's in the air what's in the water what's in the thing you cannot take every variable out <laughs> but in another in some respects it doesn't matter because if you can find a way like a lot of people are to influence people's belief systems then you can manipulate that for the positive and for the negative um on virtually anything and so i think with this with this world we're looking at we're living in at the moment i love those four ideas and i'd love to hear from people watching this what's missed off that list what what other yeah things are there because it, this is the 64 million dollar question isn't it is about the more you can we can understand what are driving these things the better decisions we can make for ourselves and for others because at the end of the day it's that lack of not understanding if you don't know the rules of a football game you're not going to win the football game mm. Um, you know, if you don't know, everyone talks about it, you know, being 3D, 4D, 5D chess or whatever they're going to say. But if you do, if if your opponent knows the rules of the game better than you do, you want to hide into nothing. And, and I'm really on that stage, Alan, with sort of saying, well, what are these rules that we need to be aware of better? Because it's pretty obvious up until sort of where we're at now that the people that are directing things and certainly in the way that I don't want to see it going know those rules a lot better than I do. Yeah, see, the thing is, I was just going to throw in there before we move on to that, um, that uh, I've, I spoke to a guy about being a breatharian. Um, mm. So technically... I saw some, a brilliant interview on that. It was amazing. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't technically have to eat anything if you don't want it. That's a choice. But regarding... Um, 
uh, opinions. You know, the 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 uh, the in joke in IT is how many hardware engineers do the, does it take to change a light bulb? One to do it, and the other nine to discuss how they would do it because everybody will have a solution. Yeah. Now. If that solution leads to the same goal, that's fair enough. You have to go with one that you feel comfortable with. And maybe that's what we're doing right? regarding our food, regarding our religion, where whatever resonates with us, we'll go down that path as long as it leads to where we want to get to. Um, but we have to find out where we want to get to. Where is that get to place? You know, and what do we need to get there? And where do we want to go? I mean, just talk about. Um, everything that's going on up to 2030, apparently you're going into, we're in the age of Aquarius and then 2030, we're going to have the golden age and things are going to change. They talk about the med beds, the technologies there. They showed us that in the movie Elysium where the, the woman puts the baby or a child in the in the, the bed and it cures her. And it's in the movie um, Stargate where, uh, you know, there's a, a chamber there that he, he the girl gets killed, his girlfriend gets killed and she he puts her in this uh um, med bed, if you want to call it, and uh, esophagus, and she gets healed. So we do have the technology, and um, to, to kind of live longer lives and and to heal. I mean, if you go back to you know to talk about the Book of Enoch, where he lived eight hundred years. So you know, I just think that the the system, this you know holographic program. This program created by ETs, this creationism, whatever you want to call it, has been circumvented by a negative force, has been taken over. Maybe this is part of what was supposed to happen. And I know they say that we learn more from ne from negatives than positives. Um, and it's all about the learning. But and I, I don't have a problem with learning, but you have to apply common law. You know, harm, loss or injury. I don't mind learning as long as people aren't getting hurt or getting things stolen or damaged. So surely source creator or ETs understand common law. And why can't they apply that in the learning of uh, being down here? I, that's a really good point, because I think they could. But it seems to me my, where I'm at at the moment, which with me, the way I go, it could change in five minutes time quite easily. <laughs> but where I'm at at the moment, Alan, is it says they're consciously choosing not to, um, which says a lot about sort of where we're at. And that's where I find really interesting is the motivations for um, what's going on with this. And, and it, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because from my human mind point of view, I really want to know. I want to do the, I always hated that. What's that thing with the yellow brick road? Yeah, the Wizard of Oz film. Mm -hmm. I always hated that film with the vengeance. I thought it was creepy and ridiculous. But I do want to pull back the curtain and see who's pulling the screens. But then perhaps the time, but then equally, you don't want to wish your life away. Mm. So, it's perhaps a time when you're meant to know that. Perhaps that's the whole point. We're not meant to. But it's still, the, for me, there's a missing link for me, Alan, about I do believe there's a lot of people that understand these universal laws, whatever what you call them, very well and are applying them for their own benefit pretty effectively. Mm. What do you think about that? I mean, where do you think they're at with that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think people have to be very careful and, and you know, you can very, very easily go down the rabbit hole and um, get lost down there and they, it can consume your life. This information can consume your life. And I remember I had one chap um, speak to me and he was saying about the, when the shooting happened in Los Angeles and he was going, well, I'm not too sure. I was looking to see if he had two guns or three guns. And I said, hang on a minute. I said, hang on. I said, do you believe there's a group of elites in this world controlling the planet? He said, yes. And I said, right. Stop what you're doing and go and play with your kids. Because you don't need to know whether your man had two guns or three guns or what, you know, shells he had. or You know, you don't need to know all that. Once you know that the air planet is being um, corrupted and being controlled and manipulated by uh, an elite group of people and probably more than that outside, you know, maybe the outside the planet part of it is being controlled as well. If you know that, then that's all you need to know. Don't don't go too much down the rabbit hole because, you know, it did consume me in the early days. It really did trying to find the answer. And I still don't know the answer. I, I have a good bit of information because I think I've been down most of the rabbit holes and anything that nothing shocks me anymore. 
because I've interviewed so many people of things that have went on and their own personal experiences. And I thought, wow, that's quite heavy. So nothing really shocks me, but I still don't have the answers for you. I can give you my opinion based on all the interviews I've done and my own experiences. But is that true? Uh, I don't know. And do uh, you see, this is an interesting question is, is I get this a lot from people that are quite happily actually going about living their lives and not concerning them with any of this. And then that sort of shifts the conversation a little bit, Alan, and listeners. I really want to hear what the listeners have got to say is that, OK, how much is it in our best interest and in the humanity and your creatures grow small best interest? You know, how far do we go with the questions? Because in one respect, one a lot of what I've learned about sort of heading towards spiritual enlightenment is, is it's all about being in the present moment. And yet all the time you're questioning, you're taking yourself out of the question, present moment. So it's a fine dance there, isn't it, for people? Yeah, definitely. I am um, again something that I came to the real realization of is focus on the things you can change and not the things you can't. There's no point worrying and having that information rent and space in your head if you can't change it. Like, you know, there's this argument regarding the flat earth, right? Whether it's flat, round, square, oblong, it, to me, it doesn't matter because I can't do anything about it. So what I try and do is focus on the things I can change and the people around me and my energy around me and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Lisa, who I do a show where every now and again, we do a news update, um, put a meme on um, Facebook there, which I thought was very good. And it kind of signified over the last 20 years. And the meme was, she had my friends 20 years ago and there's a group of people. And then my friends 10 years ago and it was half the people. And it says my friends now and it was just a dog. <laughs> so maybe as we get more knowledgeable, as we get older, we put up with less rubbish and BS from people and the system. And we go into ourselves because we can't tolerate this idle chatter, you know, and rubbish that people talk about. It just doesn't vibrate with us. It doesn't resonate with us. And people say to me, they've said to me in the past, how do I know how high my energy has come? How do I know that? And I said, well, go into an environment where it is low energy. And if you feel oh, I have to get out of here, then that will give you an idea that you've actually increased your energy because I've been around people with low energy and my God, I could feel it and sense it. And I have to get over here. I can't be around this energy. So that's a good kind of gauge. If people want to check their energy, just go to a place where you think there may be low energy. And um, because remember air auric field is on average about eight foot wide, right? So when we go shopping or we go someplace well, air auric field is rubbing off people. And there's been times that I'd go into a local shopping centre and I'd be coming out and I'd be like a ball in a china shop, you know, and I'm thinking, why am I wound up? Why am I angry? And it's probably because I rubbed off people with like a lower energy or they had something a negative or something going on and I just picked up on their energy. And uh, so it's important that you kind of bring in your energy. And I know we talk about protecting our energy and having like a gold ball around us. I used to run my own spiritual circle and did, you know, a psychic development and a psychological development, a personal development. So protecting ourselves because there are negative energies out there. And these energies do prey on people, alcohol, drugs, and you lower and you lower your energy and they'll jump in and jump out. And, People who you think are, you know, the same person could be different because there could be a, an attachment to them that's causing them to be the way they are. And this is just on another level of the whole spiritual side. But we have to understand that that does exist and it does happen. I love it. So the final thing I wanted, because I'm conscious of the time, that I wanted your thoughts are, is, you know, there's a famous saying, I've no idea who said it, but obviously didn't listen hard enough to this bit. <laughs> You know, um, if you go for the eye for an eye approach, you just end up with lots of blind people. So this issue about allowing people to change hmm. has been on my mind a lot at the moment. So a lot of um, the best people who've turned out to be whistleblowers have been people that have been involved in some quite dark stuff. And that's how they found it out. 
we now know from um, a lot of um, people that have been brave enough to come out and talk that a lot of people have been brought up with horrific abuse, SRA, all sorts of programming, mind control programs to all sorts of various degrees. You know, you've got the very extreme cases like the lovely Kathy O'Brien to less extreme cases, but all these things do go on. So where are you at um, and what words of wisdom can you sort of add to this this a business of allowing people to change and not be caught in this revenge cycle? Well, number one, you know the old saying about if you're on a plane and there's a lack of oxygen, put your mask on first. That's not being selfish. That's being logical because you can't help anybody. You have to help yourself first and then help them. So I think on a day-to-day -day basis, focus on the things you can change and you can't change. Um, focusing on your energy and taking care of yourself because you're no good to anybody if you're not feeling well. Um, be very careful of who you let into your circle. I, I always say, look at the six people around you and if they add positivity to your life, brilliant. If one of them doesn't, remove them and put somebody in because positivity feeds positivity. I think that's important. Um, and uh, yeah, just take care of your energy um, as much as you can. And uh, yeah, this journey we're all on. You know, there's some people that you won't wake up. You know, we, we all we all have an Uncle John and an Auntie Pat and they'll come and visit or you'll see them and they'll talk about the weather and the garden and everything else. They're not ready. Maybe in this lifetime they're not ready and it'd be more dangerous to them to wake them up. So we have to accept that some people are just not ready for that information. Even if you apply the psychology to them. They, it won't work because it's not resonate with them, with them. It's not they're not ready for the information. So you just accept the fact that you won't wake everybody up. But if you're going to do it, try and apply the psychology and not the content because you'll argue all night with the content. But if you apply the psychology and find out, number one, are they have do they, do they have a teenage mind or an adult mind? And number two, how does the mind work when their belief system is challenged? Mm -hmm. You know, so it, that's why. Uh, now what I do more so, I'm really taking more of a back seat these days. I still have interviews. I have a, a, about three interviews lined up. I have a famous ex-footballer that I'm um, I'm penciling in for an interview who's come out as a whistleblower. So that should be soon. And uh, a couple of other people who I'll, I'll have on the list. And over time, because I've been, you know, we've been doing this a while, Catherine, and, you know, and it's not a case of, I don't want to be, uh, make it look arrogant or ego, oh, I've been doing this a long time, but I have been doing it a long time. So should we apologise for the effort and the work that we've put in to people who haven't done it? You know, because somebody, uh, Ross said to me when I want to say somebody, but Ross said to me about, you know, maybe, may, maybe not talk about, you know, the length of time that you've been doing this. And I said, but, why should I apologize for my effort and my work to people who haven't done it? You know, I mean, I have done it. I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews and I've been involved and not just interviews, but I've been involved in being in court with people, stopping them from losing their house. I've been, you know, eviction people. I've been in houses where they were waiting on the sheriff to turn up to stop them from taking over the house. I've done, you know, obviously charity stuff with the paid forward, you know, so I've done quite a lot. So I think, I think I feel I've done my apprenticeship now. And now what I'm doing is just, you know, um, just the odd interview with people and talking about things and being involved in the odd thing, but I'm not doing as much as I used to do because um, again, focusing on what I need to do for myself and my family, you know, that has to be a priority. Absolutely. I'm with you. I'm very rapidly turning into as best a gardener as I can. I'm planting everything everywhere. So and um, going to have to go out and do another sunshine dance because it's very great again. Um, no, I love it. I love this conversation. I hope for many more. Now, for the listeners, where's the best place for them to find you, Alan? Right. Best thing to do is go over to circleofwhitelightradio.com and on there you'll have all the information about me. You'll have the social links. So you'll find my Rumble channel on there. You'll find my Facebook channel on there. Please subscribe 
and sign up. And um, I like, you know, again, having conversations with people and getting their opinion as well. I don't know everything. I'm learning as much as anybody else. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, but if you if there's something that they give me which challenges my belief system, I will be asking them for the evidence, the tangible evidence. Um, and if they can do that, then happy days. But I'm not really interested in an opinion. More so, I'd like to see the evidence, you know. Love it. OK, well, let us know. Uh, we want to hear your comments below. What are you at? Who do you where do you think us humans came from? How are you balancing these times about balancing the, the the desire for questions and you know getting on and just really living a lovely happy fulfilling life thanks alan i'm sure we'll be back again soon and thank you everyone who's watched us today thanks uh, for having me on Catherine. i really enjoyed it thank you thank you so much for taking the time to listen and if you feel inspired please do share with your friends and family this helps us spread the word and also helps me encourage some exciting new guests to take part in this podcast and above all, stay curious and stay free.